Well, good morning, church family. Good morning. This morning looks a little different from a usual Sunday. We're actually uh, calling this I Said Yes Testimony Sunday. Okay, it's the truth of the fact that you and I, the Bible says, and we've, we've been walking through the book of Acts, right, that you and I are the living temple of God. And, and all through the morning, you've heard different testimonies of, of God using us as his agents, allowing us to participate in the gospel and to shine the light of Jesus Christ in an incredible way, in different aspects, different facets of our life, at work, in our family, serving here at the church. If we, if we, in your mind, if you go all the way back to where we were in the spring, that is coming out of Easter, we began a study on the Holy Spirit, right? That the Holy Spirit indwells us as born again believers and then gives us spiritual giftings. So pause and comprehend this, right? God indwells us, so we are now the new living temple, but then he empowers us for ministry. Each of us with uniqueness for ministry and for purpose. And then this fall, we've been walking through the book of Acts. And you should know by now that the thesis uh, verse for the entire book of Acts is Acts 1 8, right? Where Jesus promises the disciples, he says, Go back to Jerusalem, right? Because you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you shall be my witnesses. Guys, that's our calling too to be filled with the Spirit, to have power that comes from Him so that we can be His witnesses. Do you believe that God wants to work in you? Do you really believe that? Okay, now often, church family, that begins with a simple yes. Okay, a simple yes, a willingness to say, you know what, God, I'm gonna pray and I'm gonna ask for you to show me my purpose. And I trust that you are gonna open and close doors in my life and as I step out, that I'm gonna use reason, right? It's good to, to think where am I gifted, even take a, something as practical as a spiritual gift survey, that I'm gonna use reason and I'm gonna step out in faith. I'm gonna make those first steps of faith and believing that you will steer me for your kingdom. Hebrews 11.6 says this, and without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. Do you believe that God is a rewarder of you when you seek him? Okay. Therefore, we should step out with faith. Faith is believing. You know what? I'm going to take this step because I believe that God has a purpose for me and that God will reward me. He will steer. He, he will open and close doors. And then secondly, this morning, are you willing to be steered as you step out in faith? Are you willing to be steered? Quick example of this in scripture. In 2 Samuel chapter 7, David had this magnificent idea that he was going to build for God a temple. Now, long story short, God came back and told him, you know what? That's a great idea. I'm actually really pleased that you said that. But listen, you're not going to be the one to do it. Your son, Solomon, is going to be the one who builds the temple. Do you know what David spent a good portion of the rest of his life doing after that? Okay, 1 Chronicles 22 actually tells us that David stored up materials for Solomon to build the temple. Okay, iron and timber and stone and bronze, a huge amount of money he stored up for Solomon to build the temple, his son. You see, he had plans, but then he allowed the Lord to steer him. So that's our question this morning. Church family, let me introduce to you Mike Kenshin, who is uh, sitting down with us this morning and is going to give us a little bit of his testimony. 
Um, Mike and his wife Tracy have been members here of First Baptist for 24 years. He's been a deacon for 19 years. Uh, they've raised all four children uh, here at First Baptist, serving on committees and all sorts of stuff. Uh, Mike also has a, a, a business background in the corporate world and has transitioned to operating and owning many of his own personal businesses. Uh, so you guys welcome Mike. Now, Mike, it, it says here that you'd like to make a public statement that Coke is better than Pepsi. <laughs> That's an inside personal joke. If you know a, a little bit back, Mike and I had the awesome privilege of going to uh, Uganda this summer together, and there was a, a running joke about Coke and Pepsi. I, of course, like Coke best, and so... Uh, <laughs> We won't talk about that. We won't talk about that. All right, so Mike, it was a joy and a privilege to get to, to really know you considerably uh, more on our mission trip to Uganda this past summer, but that was actually your second trip to Uganda. Uh, and so take me back to the beginning of that story. My, my Say Yes to the Lord was started four years ago when uh, Tracy and I realized we were transitioning into soon becoming empty nesters. And uh, so... You know, I started asking the Lord a couple years early, saying, Lord, where do you want me to serve? What do you want us to do in this next stage of our life? Um, you know, we want to finish strong. We want to uh, be in your will. And, and so, Lord, you just show us what it is. I have no parameters on that. I assumed it might be, you know, helping here in church, some local ministries that we, we have involved, have been involved in in the past, but I was open to whatever. And so several months of praying over that and, and asking the Lord and, and looking at different options and being open, um, one day, just through wonderful circumstances, I was talking to Don Jones and sharing with him and saying, man, you know, Don, I'm, I'm really praying about this. I really want to get this right. And, and he said, you know, your timing couldn't be any better. He said, I, there's a ministry in Uganda that I've been involved with, and they're doing tremendous work, and they need somebody uh, to help them with your background, with a little bit of um, organization and planning and budgeting and they're, they're growing so fast and I think that would be a real asset for them for you to, to do that. Would you like to talk to them? And that was Fred Sakachiwa with Celebrate Hope Ministry uh, that was here, what, two weeks ago? Mm -hmm. And you, you might have met when he was introduced uh, at the end of each service, he and his wife Rebecca. So he arranged a meeting for us a couple weeks later. Fred came in from Uganda and we spent a lot of time and together and he, he, you know, after that, I was really excited about his mission and his, his heart for his people in Rockai. Uh, if you recall, Rockai, Uganda was this, the uh, epicenter of the AIDS epidemic where it started, just devastated that region. Fred lived there, uh, was raised in that, went to Kampala, went to seminary, and then when he uh, graduated from seminary, although getting into ministry with African Renewal Ministry, he ultimately felt a calling of God to go back to his people and help there. And that's where his ministry has been for the past 12 years. So I, he asked if I would serve on his board uh, of directors for Celebrate Hope USA, and I agreed to do that. And um, three months later, we were, John and Marie Nip and my daughter Lexi and I were headed to Uganda. So Le Lexi went with you? Yeah, if she, well, she was 16. Yeah, why, why did you want Lexi to go with you? Well, I, you know, I felt like it was an opportunity I'd never had before. I felt like it would take her out of her comfort zone. Uh, she has a passion for, for, for people and kids and serving anyway. I felt like it, it, there were so many opportunities for her to firsthand experience working with children. She was, we had set up, she was able to work with children in orphanages and different schools while we were there that, that 10 days. Uh, African Renewal Ministry, who we've, we've been involved with for gosh, almost 20 years now, they have a, a ministry to babies, and you and I saw that there, uh, that babies have been abandoned. One was there, was three days old. Mm -hmm. And so she was able to spend a day there caring for those babies and seeing how that ministry works. So it really broadened her perspective. Um, since then, she's went on the Yucatan mission trip uh, with Linda and Ed and James and, and that team. And that was a wonderful experience for her. This past summer, um, she, through <laughs> Texas A&M University, and, uh, one of the ministries there we spent eight weeks in Florida uh, just going out sharing her faith uh, during the evenings and 
and, and taking the courage to do that. She would have never, never had that experience, I don't believe, if we wouldn't have taken that step and going to Uganda. So it's been a blessing for us and for her. Now, how, how did God uh, r- really kind of change your heart or, or take that next step on, on your first trip to Uganda? We went to, to see the ministry and to see it firsthand what Fred had done, but I had asked the Lord, although we're, we're helping with the ministry, where, where, where do you want me to serve? Where do you want me to concentrate? Because he has so many, uh, you know, the children's program, of course, you've seen, and he has uh, the coffee uh, production, and he has uh, the sustainability programs for the, for the families there. And so it was toward the end of this thing, and I kept saying, Lord, I, I just want you to show me where you want me to focus my energies, besides the overall direction, vision of the, of the ministry, helping him with that. And Fred asked John and I one day to, he said, we're gonna take you to visit some of our pastors. And so we went about 80 miles out into this remote area and over the, we came up on this little mud brick, little adobe type building. And uh, that was their local church in one of, these, one of these villages. And there were eight pastors there that were part of his ministry uh, that he had started. And they had walked all of them from different villages for miles just to spend some time with us. And while we were there, we, we of course, we fellowshiped with them and, and, and had a great time. But when I got ready to leave, I asked them, I said, what do you need? What can we do for you? And, and, I, and I figured they made material or something. They said to, to a man, we, we just need to know, and we're training. We just need to know how to be better pastors, how to share the gospel, how to, how to pastor in our local villages. And we, we just need more training. So, and that just, go ahead. Oh, 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 well, I mean, I, I just love thinking through the story. So here, here's a member of our church, a deacon, a, a businessman who just begins to pray, uh, Lord, what, how do you want to use me? What's this next season of ministry? And then uh, before we know it, you're, you're uh, on the other side of the world, taking a mission trip with, with your daughter. You're serving on, on the board there. And, and now you have... Uh, 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 even clearer calling in terms of you, you feel like God's calling you to to serve pastors in Uganda because they they need resources and and they uh, so many of them uh, aren't able even to read and so uh, what did you find because I know after that uh, you're you're going to spend uh, years kind of chasing uh, this pursuit and so where did that kind of lead you Yeah so that that the Lord hit me over the head with that. This is where I want you to concentrate. So like Jason was saying, we, we came back and we've spent the last couple of years putting together training programs, putting a pastor into place there in the ministry that would oversee quarterly training sessions, buying tents and, and, and traveling equipment and things that they need for, for these pastor trainings. There are 260 of these pastors. Rock Eye is about the size of Kendall County. And Fred in the first 12 years has already started 260 of these local churches, little pastor community churches. It's amazing. So, uh, but like you said, in, in coming back finding material, I realized the vast majority of these, they can't even, they, they all speak Luganda, but many of them can't read. So we bought them Bibles and we had training material and all they could do was listen to the trainer, but they couldn't read their Bibles. So I started looking for answers for that and I found a ministry in Minneapolis, Minnesota that has taken they, they put things on these MP3 players. And they had taken 72 translated languages that missionaries needed material and put the entire Old and New Testament on them. And uh, what a ministry it was and exactly what we needed. So we bought these for them. They were also able to download seven uh, training messages from, from Fred, uh, 80 Bible stories so that they could punch this in, set it there and listen to the village, listen and listen to Bible stories, more pastor training material. So, so we purchased these and, and, and we were able to take them back when we went in July of this year. Yeah, and so, so this summer we got to go back on a mission trip. How many did you end up taking? Back with us, we took a hundred. We took a hundred, and uh, now, now uh, we were actually able. It was a surprise, but we went to a blind village and and just thought, you know what, we, we can probably spare. I think about five or ten of them for for this blind village because they need to be able to hear the Bible too. Um, and so, incredible, really God blessing part of that story. Um, and so, Mike, I want you to share, uh, lastly with us, just about the prison story, because uh, if you've ever been on a mission trip, the, the number one rule is be flexible, all right? And so uh, this is 
one of those moments that, that looked to be a, a great disappointment, but as it turns out, the, the Lord had an incredible plan in store for us. Yeah, you, you have to be real flexible with your schedule when you're there. And uh, we were scheduled this one particular day to go to several places. And then at the, toward the end of the day, Jason and I were gonna visit a, a prison there and he was gonna preach and I was gonna share a testimony. And when you go on these trips, you know several months ahead of time. So we had planned about six months and God, had, I felt like the Lord had given me something to share with these inmates, uh, a personal story that I thought would relate to them. And I was really excited about it. And so we get there and they said, we're closing in 15 minutes. We closed the prison off at five o'clock <laughs> and we didn't know that. So we had to rush in there and Jason just shared the gospel with us, these guys as, as quickly as possible. We had by then 10 minutes and we were ushered out. So the next morning, I, well, you it, were pretty bummed. I was bummed. <laughs> I woke up at 2.30 in the morning. I said, you know, Lord, you, you seem like you've given me this. And I really was excited about sharing it. But you, you know, you know, it's, it's, it's your, your call. But I, I was kind of discouraged about it. I woke up at 2.30 the next morning and, and, and I even read through my material again in my presentation for some reason. And, but the next morning, about 7.30, I got up early to go outside to this beautiful area uh, by the hotel and it was just had my quiet time. A few minutes later, pastor comes out to do the same thing. And he said, you know, I just, I feel bad about you not being able to share yesterday. And I know we're going back by tomorrow, this afternoon on our way to another place to drop off some of these MP3 players to these inmates. And uh, he said, let's pray right now that the Lord will open a door for you to get to share with these guys. So he prayed and, and we prayed together that Lord would somehow open that door. So we go back by the prison and I went up there to give this guy the MP3 players. Of course, the guard's stand there and he's got his AK-47 and he's all, and uh, Jason says to him, uh, he had something he wanted to share with the inmates yesterday. I uh, didn't get a chance to do it. Is there any chance we could do it this morning? And uh, he said, well, let me check and see. So he comes back and he says, yeah, but only one of you can come in. So I start, it's great. So I go to walk in of course, pastor comes right in behind me, wouldn't take no for an answer. <laughs> He wasn't going to miss. So, so we walk in, and God's timing is everything. Because we walk in, and now there are four times as many inmates out there. They're all just hanging around. Some of them are kicking soccer balls, and some of them are just visiting. And, and they ushered us out there, and they still had the microphone up, which you had used in, in this one area we were using. And the, and the interpreter that we had was hanging around right there for some reason, too. Of course, God knows why, but... We were allowed to grab him, and so I was able to share uh, my testimony with these guys, and uh, it was just incredible. The Lord opened the door, and, and seven of them uh, raised their hand and came forward to accept Christ. So, yes. yeah, it really was one of those God moments where we could look back and. and because you had prepared well ahead of time in preparation, we had prayed through this, and then and that door is shut, and then. Uh, uh, Turns out the, the Lord wanted four times as many people to hear your testimony and, and to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. And so would you guys pray with me real quick as, as we contemplate how awesome it is that God uses us in ministry? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that you allow us to be your hands and feet. God, that is such good news that you allow us to participate, to share our stories, our testimonies about how you reached in and touched our hearts, God, and that connects with other men and women who have been made in your image in order to hear the good news of Jesus. God, thank you for that. May we never forget the, that awesome power and privilege that you use us and you allow us to be your witnesses. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, amen, church. Our Father is good, isn't he? We would say that, amen. Our second interview that we have this morning, guys, if you don't know her, this is Rachel Russo, and she is an incredible, give her a hand. She is an incredible, incredible godly woman. Uh, she has served here uh, on staff at FBC for 10 years uh, in a number of different roles in the student ministry and the communications department. Um, she has also been a foster parent for nine years. 
Um, and during that time, fostering uh, 14 children uh, and adopting two. Uh, she is the founder of Vault Fostering Community, a nonprofit organization uh, that serves uh, foster families and children in the uh, uh, San Antonio and greater area. Um, she's, been, she's become a, a very powerful and important voice in the foster care community uh, in San Antonio and right here at our church. Uh, she helps lead our, uh, our FBC's foster, uh, foster care ministry here at First Baptist Bernie. Um, keeping our church body aware of all that's going on in the fostering community, the needs. Uh, she leads our foster parent night out. Uh, the next one is November 12th, so mark that on your calendar. Um, as well as she's added to that list uh, a, uh, a midweek small group discussion that has now been growing every week uh, for connecting in, in a support system for uh, foster and adopting families in our community. Um, and so, Rachel, everything I've just described, this, this is your life. Um, it's amazing whenever one sits and, and lists it all out. Uh, did you ever imagine that your life would be uh, like this? And how did you get here? I 100% did not imagine. Well, you would ask me, even if you asked me like a year ago, did you imagine your life would look like this in a year? I would have said no. So it feels like it's just constantly changing and um, growing, I'm being stretched, but um, you asked me like, will you share a testimony of when you, a time when you said yes, and I was just like, I could sit up there for hours talking about time after time after time where God called me to say a yes that was terrifying, you know, or um, just scary or just uncomfortable, and um, you know, he ends up blessing me in the process. And I loved all the stories, just hearing all of those. I hadn't heard them yet. And so just hearing the consistency of the message that no one regrets those yeses. Um, I will say that in every one of those times, none of those yeses really were like my preference. I, I really, my response initially is like, I'd, I'd rather not. When God's like, hey, I'm calling you to this. And it's like, I'm good, like, I'm, <laughs> that sounds not cool. Uh, and eventually there's just this uh, growing process and a little bit of tug of war with God, but um, eventually getting to a place, you know, I, I was thinking the other day, my kids were watching the movie Moana, and I like really related to Moana when she's screaming at the ocean and like trying to throw back this glowing stone, and she's like, pick someone else. Like, I don't wanna do this anymore, you know? Uh, that was very relatable to me. However, um, this, this saying yes has always eventually ended in goodness and blessing and intimacy with the Lord. So, so take me to the first time that you said yes to, uh, to foster care. Because as a single woman, I could, I could imagine that that's quite scary. Uh, you know, I'm just thinking of, of time and money and even perception. Yeah, so I, in 2014, I was actually already in full-time vocational ministry here at First Baptist and kept feeling this prompting. I was kind of seeing some other scenarios where foster care was playing out, and I kept feeling this prompting to participate and uh, I had a lot of resistance and a lot of very valid reasons why this probably wasn't for me. And um, I think one of the things was I argued with God a lot because I'm like, my whole life is ministry. Like all week into the evenings, I was doing student ministry. Like I, I'm investing in kids in our community, you know, uh, kind of arguing that like, but my home, like that's, that's too far. <laughs> You've taken this too far, God. Like, that, that's my safe place. That's my haven. And like, ugh. But um, he continued to um, draw me and kind of really um, assure me that following him, uh, my safety would be in him and my haven is in him, not in my home. So, um, I know, I, I just, I remember saying like, Lord, I know that what you want is better. I know what you want for me is better, but what I want and where I'm at feels a lot safer 
so I'm cool with this. Like, I, I think I'm okay with it. And it's not really until that started to be too uncomfortable that I said, I, I mean, basically most of my yeses are just throwing my hands up and saying, fine, <laughs> you know? Like, <laughs> let's get real. Like, it's not this like magical, like, uh, like spiritual moment. It's like, okay. And then the, the supernatural starts to kind of, uh, show up where it's like, oh, this is where he's working, and here I am with him. And so you started foster care in in 2014, and and yeah, did you so, think that was going to be a long term endeavor? Uh, I wasn't sure what it would be, but it was definitely. I said yes to the temporary, so I said yes to I'm a foster only. That's what they call it, home where I am the middle person. So if a if a child needs a temporary place they can come to me and then they either, there's two options, they either reunify with a biological family member and things get safe again and they get to go home, which we celebrate, or I had at least six kids um, move into an adoptive home where they move on to their permanent family, their forever family, uh, the, next, the next thing. And so I said, I had a very hard permanent boundary uh, with God, and um, my experience, if you've been walking with Jesus for any amount of time, you may have experienced that. He's not like the best at respecting your boundaries. <laughs> so um, <laughs> permanency did become uh, part of our story. Um, in 2018, no one was more shocked. I noticed that Mike did not have tissues <laughs> up here. Um, no one was more shocked than me when I adopted my son, Lucas. Um, there were a lot of fears and uh, like, like legitimate um, reasons why I shouldn't have probably, you know, like things where it's like, this is probably not the best idea, Rachel, but the Lord just, this is, this is the plan, you know? Um, and so I... Uh, in 2018, adopted Lucas, and uh, our family, that changed the course of our family, basically, because before that, it was me, and then we were a family. Yeah, so, so let me interject here. So think about this with me, right? Because we love Rachel's obedience, uh, that you got into foster care because you know that Christians are called to, to care for and to serve the most vulnerable, uh, but you went in with a temporary yes. Yes, God, I'll be obedient, thinking it's for this season. And then four years later, you have uh, adopted your son, Lucas. Uh, now, meanwhile, you're still working uh, uh, full-time for the church, and, and Vault is beginning to take off uh, in that ministry. And as a single mom, I'm sure at that point in 2018, right after you adopted Lucas, that you thought, uh, God is done stretching me now. Yeah, this feels good. This feels good. Um, yeah, so three months after Lucas's adoption was finalized and we were kind of settling into like, this is what our family looks like for now. Um, I was working here at the church and I was sitting in, in my office up top and my cell phone rang and it was a mystery caller, which I typically don't answer mystery callers. I also told Jason I don't recommend answering mystery callers. Because uh, it might be God. It might be God calling. <laughs> like that's, watch, watch out for mystery callers. Uh, because I answered the phone and um, they said, is this the parent who has adopted Lucas? And I said, yes, it is. And she said, I, I'm a caseworker, an investigator for uh, DFPS. And uh, he has a sibling that was born. And um, he or he actually, I didn't know it was a boy or a girl at this point. He, she said, uh, he, this baby is in the hospital. He, I don't know, I think he was seven days old and needs to be discharged today. And we're wondering if you would accept placement. And I, I mean, I can't really explain like the, that it was like everything became a blur at that point. Like I didn't really hear much of what she was saying, but I just was like, yes, of course. Like he's our family. And then like the flood of like, what on earth did you just do? And so I said, wait, 
can I call you back? I think I should probably process this before I just impulsively say yes. And um, she said, uh, yeah, you can call me back, but like we need placement soon. And I said, okay, I'll call you back. And I started, I probably, there might still be like worn carpet in that office because I started pacing and praying and saying like, Lord, you know that this was already a big deal to take one kid and like, do you guys know the cost of daycare? Like that, just that alone, I was like, I can't, I can't. It's not, it's impossible. Like, I, I can't do this. And I heard very clearly, sorry, I heard a message that um, I continue to repeat over and over. Um, the Lord said, you don't know what treasures I have for you. Just keep saying yes. Sorry. Hmm. Um, so we said yes to Jasper, and um, he's permanent now. So that's what he said. I have two adopted sons. Um, but part of that message from the Lord, I think I took a little bit of my own interpretation in that moment to maybe like make it okay. <laughs> and I thought, okay, he must mean that the treasures he has for me is more income or a different housing situation or a different vehicle situation or a husband. I mean, that <laughs> could be a treasure. Uh, <laughs> sorry, that's not a joke. That is not a joke. Um, I had all these ideas of what that would, that would look like, what, what the treasure would be. And as some days and weeks and months passed, uh, I just kept, I, I was kind of like trying to think of what to name him and just kind of word, word studying this word treasure. And um, in 2 Corinthians chapter four, verse seven says, but we have this treasure in jars of clay to show, the surpass, show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not driven to despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus may, may, the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. And um, I think just like the assurance that the treasure is that I get him, that I get to be a part of the work, that I get um, to be the vessel that he uses. It didn't have to be me. I didn't have to say yes. But I, I like got to. Um, so I think people frequently say, I know they say it to me, but I know to lots of foster parents or missionaries or people doing like what looks to you to be an extraordinarily hard thing. Um, I get told all the time, I don't know how you do it. You are amazing. You must have a special like blessing from God. There's something special about you. You know, these phrases that, that we hear as foster parents and um, I frequently kind of want to say, I think that's a cop out because I promise you there's nothing special about me. I am, the only difference between me and you is that I said yes. And I'm not saying that you need to say yes to foster care. In fact, some of you should not say yes to foster care. I'll make that clear. But I'm saying that we all have a thing that God is calling us to say yes to. And you should say yes because he is faithful in that. Um, and... I think it's like a belief that we have that's, that you have to be special to do the, the hard things. And it's not. You just have to have Jesus. That's it. Yeah. So when in reality, that's, that's the gospel call, right? The good news of the gospel is, is not only that Jesus has died in my stead and resurrected for my sins, but that the gospel calls us into our own death. Our own death, right? Jesus says, anyone who wishes to follow after me must take up his cross daily to follow me. Because with Jesus, death is always followed by resurrection. 
That is the resurrected life in us. That's what this verse 10 said, right? It is, it is we die so that the resurrected life of Christ may shine through us. And that, God is, is calling us deeper, as Christians, deeper into the gospel. And so, as you stated, uh, you now have two sons, uh, and you named uh, your second son Jasper because that means uh, treasure. Um, Jasper means treasure. And so, uh, since, since adopting those, those two boys now, Jasper, uh, you've, you've left uh, First Baptist. I haven't forgiven you for that, to go to vault full-time. So she's, she's at vault full-time. Uh, and recently, you just received another phone call. Yes. Um, when Jason asked me, I don't know, a couple weeks ago, hey, would you share a testimony of when you've said yes? I know you've even recently said a big yes. You know, like, would you share that? And I said, um, yeah, uh, I could do that. But it might be depressing because it, it's a hard season right now. Like, it's not, I'm not... I wish I could say that saying yes to some hard things, like once you, once you get past and you say the yes, like it gets easy or it's a, it's a cakewalk after that. You just got to say the yes and then it's all good. Um, we got another call. I mean, it's basically deja vu. Another call, another baby, another son in our home who likely will become permanent. Um, and it has not been an easy not as easy as I thought it would be transition. Um, and so, yeah, like I told Jason, like I, I might not have a lot of positive things to say about the, the hard parts of saying yes, but I do have a lot of hopeful things to say. Um, we've been, at my house, we've been playing this song over and over in the house, in the car. Um, my brain just was like, you're a, you're a liar, foundation. Rachel, because the song you've really been playing is This Girl Is On Fire, because that's Jasper's favorite song, and he asks you to play it all the time. <laughs> so second to that song is uh, um, Maverick City Music has a song called Firm Foundation, and uh, some of the lyrics say, I've still got joy in chaos. I've got peace that makes no sense. I won't be going under. I'm not held by my own strength because I've built my life on Jesus and he's never let me down. He's faithful through every season. So why would he fail now? And it says he won't. And that, um, that is the hopeful piece is that I know he won't fail me, but not even will he not fail me. He will be uh, gentle and tender with me in the process when I'm... Uh, when it sucks, <laughs> when it's hard, when I'm angry or when I'm grieving, sorry, um, he, he is very patient and he brings me back to this verse that's, he's like, I mean, the treasure is that you won't be crushed, Rachel, yeah. like, You'll be challenged, you'll be stretched, but you won't, I'm not, I didn't bring you here to crush you. Amen. Um, so uh, we are very hopeful in this season and God is going to take, because of what he's done in the past, I have full assurance and full confidence yeah, we know. that he will um, make this beautiful and um, show his glory and manifest um, his life through our surrender and our yes. Amen. Amen. So wh what would you say to someone here today who might be in a scary season uh, where they sense that God is calling them to step out in courageous faith, um, but the cost is, is scary and they don't know how it's going to turn out? Yeah, I was just thinking about that um, as I was listening to the other stories because I, I think everyone's I would encourage you that the thing that God's, like, God's not asking you, he didn't ask me in 2014 to adopt three kids, to say yes to that. He, did, he didn't take me all the way there. Um, it, was, it was baby steps along the way, and it was, um, he, yeses that felt huge. Like, saying yes to foster care felt like my whole life is getting wrecked. And now foster care is like, 
I just do that. That's a thing I do. Um, and not, I don't do it without the power of Jesus because it's hard, but um, I think that there's, God's gonna call you into, he's calling um, you into it. He'll, he'll ease you into it, I yeah. guess. Is that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I was thinking like, um, for some people, I was thinking about the gearlings and they're like out, they're serving their whole family, uprooted, brought to Africa. Um, but God might just be asking you to show up to a lunch after church to learn about a mission trip. Like, he's not saying pack up and move to Africa, unless he is. I'm not gonna pretend to know what God's telling you. But um, I just think there's this like, he, he likely is, is going to ask us to do baby steps. Maybe it's not foster care, but maybe it is volunteering for a parent's night out so a foster parent can have a break. That's a huge yes for some of you guys. Um, I think for some people, he might be saying, I want, I want some of your finances. Like you, ha you haven't surrendered that to me. You haven't um, given that to me. But then for others, he's saying, you're real good at writing checks, but... I got something, something else for you, you know? So it's gonna be different for all of us. Um, it's really leaning in and um, the, it's just that surrender piece. Like, but that, my encouragement would be that you can trust him with your yes, that he will be gentle with you, he will be patient with you, he yeah. will carry you through. Um, the fear is not from him and it really is not legitimate. Amen, amen. So beloved, I want, I want you to think about this. Think about all the testimonies we've heard this morning, right? Remember Acts 1-8, and you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, power to be witnesses. And whether that's at work or in your home or serving here on campus um, or, or Mike uh, on a mission trip uh, on the other side of the world, or Rachel with foster care, like you can hear these testimonies. And I wanna ask you again, all right? Do you believe that God is a rewarder of those who seek him and that he wants to open doors in your life and show you your next season of ministry? Do you believe that? And are you willing to be steered by him so that he has the freedom to say, all right, now I'm going to take you over here and now I'm going to take you over here. So we're going to end this service a little different this morning. Okay. It's been a different service. Let's, let's end it different. If you are here this morning and you know that this service was for you because because there's, there's something in, in your life that God has uh, been, been calling you to step out in faith. Or that this morning was a shot in the arm because, because you are renewed afresh anew in terms of praying for God's plan and purposes in your life. If that's you this morning, I'm going to ask for you to, to come forward. And if you would line the front kind of altar here, if you would. And we're going to pray over you in a moment. So I'm going to ask you to do something bold. This whole thing's been about be bold. So if this sermon has been for you and you know it, I want, to, I want you to make your way forward. The, and the, the saints are going to pray over you. Now, if... Also, if you are here this morning and you are in a season of discouragement, you are in the middle of the fight. I'm going to ask Rachel to come right down here in the front. We started by just saying, Rachel, we want to pray over you. So much faith and courage to adopt to, and we know that, that you are in the, the season of, of now taking on this, this uh, third child, uh, Shiloh, and, and we want to pray over you as, as a church because we, we want to walk with you. We want you to have faith and be encouraged. You are not alone. If that is you, if you are in that darkness this morning, if you would come and you would line this stage. We want to pray over you. Maybe it's, it's, it's a dark season because, because one of your, your children has walked away from the Lord. If you want us to pray over you, would you make your way? 
Now, church family, I'm gonna ask for, for some of you to, to come and just to surround, and I want you to extend hands, but I want some of you to actually make your way around here, all right? We don't have a ton of room, okay? Uh, but I want you to, we're, we're, we're a family, and, and we're gonna pray in the name of Jesus Christ. We are the living temple, all right? We, we talked a couple weeks ago about praying in Jesus' name means we get to come before the throne of heaven. In Jesus' name. Not because we are worthy, but because he is worthy. And he has done it all on our behalf. And there is power when we pray. So if you're staying in your seat, if you would just extend your hand out as we pray over our dear ones, our Heavenly Father. You are so good. And we want to pause to thank you for allowing us to participate in your gospel. That your gospel not only saves us, but we participate in it. And Father, there are dear ones here this morning who, who need to hear what your plans for them are. And that they would step out in courageous faith, trusting that you will steer them, that you will open and close doors in their lives as you see fit, and they will keep saying yes that they will keep saying yes, that yes, uh, th there will be fear, there will be cost associated with it, but you are greater. We trust you, Father, to provide, and that if you are calling us forward, you will cause all things to work together for our good. We believe that. And Father, for our dear ones who are in the middle of a storm right now, Would you be the lifter of their heads? In your tender kindness, would you lift their heads? Whenever they don't think that there can be a way and they do not see the end of the trial and the darkness that they're in, may they see the light of Jesus. May they know that they are not alone and that we walk with them and that we carry their burden with them and that you, King Jesus, are right there with them. In a supernatural way, your scripture says for us to cast all of our anxiety upon you and you will give us a peace that transcends our circumstances. We pray that right now in Jesus' name. Amen.